So let's move on to our second panel, Public Policy and Market Reforms in Transition Economics. I'm proud to introduce the moderator, my colleague Gerard Roland, who is the F. Morris Cox Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science at Berkeley. Gerard is a Belgian economist. He graduated from the Free University of Brussels in 1988. His early work was on the political economy of communism. Talk about planning. After 1990, he became one of the world's most renowned and influential scholars in transition economics, the study of economics the economies that are changing from a centrally planned economy to a market economy, such as though, of course, the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc countries, and China. He's a member of the Executive and Supervisory Committee of Sergei E, the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute, an academic institution in Prague, the Czech Republic, which specializes in economics. Girard, take over. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind introduction. So we're here to celebrate uh, Gordon. I think just looking at the program, you can see how uh, 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 vast his career has been, you know, how much influence it had. But I think certainly transition plays a special role. Uh, uh, and uh, Gordon uh, was, was there at very important moments. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, people uh, uh, in the panel will, will say a few words about that also. So uh, it's been now 30 years since the uh, transition uh, started in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, earlier actually in China. Uh, it's very difficult to describe today the excitement that existed uh, at the time. Uh, people uh, from my generation at least, or uh, uh, even uh, older people, never thought uh, the Berlin Wall would fall. We, we thought this was something that would exist throughout our life and maybe future generations. Uh, uh, nobody thought uh, after the failed coup in the Soviet Union that one week later the Communist Party of the Soviet Union would be outlawed uh, uh, in Russia. You know, so so uh, this this was you know very very exciting. It was also very exciting for economists. Uh, uh, but here uh, maybe. Uh, we can uh, point to a paradox. Uh, very often, uh, economists know the most about areas where they have the least influence. That applies, for example, to trade policy. And sometimes they have great influence in areas where they know very little. And I think uh, uh, clearly uh, the former uh, was the case for the uh, um, uh, transition process. Uh, so today, 30 years later, um, when we look at what's happening, we see the rise of autocracy in Hungary and Poland. These are members of the European Union. Uh, democracy did not last very long, uh, if it existed at all in countries uh, uh, of the uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, China has been an enormous uh, uh, economic success, uh, but uh, very uh, recently, actually in July, uh, in the Financial Times, Janusz Kornai, who is one of the world's, uh, uh, maybe the world's most famous scholar of uh, the economics of socialism, uh, and who helped actually uh, uh, um, devise some of the reforms in China, uh, kind of made a self-criticism, said, I, I contributed to creating a Frankenstein uh, when it comes to, you know, see how uh, uh, you have a, a completely new system that is a communist regime, but with a capitalist economy, uh, that's becoming uh, uh, enormously uh, uh, powerful. Uh, so um, Gordon played a you know, very important role at that time in his role as chief economist of the USAID, as uh, 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 president of the Institute for uh, Policy Reform. So uh, looking back all those 13 years, uh, uh, are there, um, can we agree on some of the lessons about what happened? Uh, uh, are there some uh, ideas that didn't come up that seem important uh, uh, today? And so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce the first speaker, uh, Nick Stern. So, so uh, uh, some of our speakers are here in cyberspace, so uh, 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 they get uh, to speak a little bit longer, but they don't get to uh, receive any questions. So uh, uh, Nick Stern is the um, uh, today, the I.G. Patel Professor of Economics and Government at the London School of Economics and Political Science. 
uh, uh, he had uh, not only an outstanding academic career, uh, but he was also chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, at a critical time between 1994 and 99. Then he was chief economist uh, uh, at the World Bank, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he has been influential not only through his work on, on transition, but also uh, the Stern report on climate change, which is something uh, very, very important. So without further ado, can we uh, listen to the video uh, that was recorded by Nick Stern? Well, first, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to participate in the celebrations of Gordon's extraordinary achievements and career, if only in this way. I, I wish I could have been with you. We worked together closely um, during a period of a few years, about 30 years ago. Of course, I'd known Gordon um, well before that because I'd worked on tea in Kenya and wheat in India, and Gordon was one of the great, is one of the great uh, agricultural economists. But of course, his interests have always been much more broad uh, than that, important, of course, of agricultural economics is. And he has been very strongly focused on the role of institutions and how they can foster uh, development uh, advance if they work well, but uh, go the other way if, if they don't. And this was a moment 30 years ago when we had just seen the fall of the Berlin Wall and also when um, market fundamentalism was at its peak. Now, in, in my view, market fundamentalism was part of the dark ages of economics, and Gordon saw that very clearly. And so the Institute of Policy Reform was set in that context when the economies of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union were trying to rebuild, um, make very rapid, strong transitions towards a market economy. And the question was, how should they do that? And Gordon saw very early that the institutions would be fundamental, that the role of government would be fundamental. It wasn't just a story of government getting out and leaving it for the free-for-all, because when that happens, um, you know, wolves start eating uh, other uh, animals in the system. And that is indeed in many places what happened. What you need for a transition to work well, what you need for an economy to work well, is, an, is a set of institutions in which people can take decisions which have some chance of coming to fruition, um, where they can analyze risks and judge risks, where they're not subject to predation. And that is something that's extraordinarily important, central to Gordon's way of thinking, to his leadership. And I think it's very important that we see that as at the core of the Institute of Policy for Reform. And that was why it was such a pleasure to work with him then. Those were moments of enormous uncertainty, 1989. We had seen uh, the empire collapse. Uh, we knew that it couldn't be the same as before. We knew that democracy was going to be part of the story. And we knew that the market economy was going to be part of the story. But we really didn't have much of an idea how democracy would develop, how market economy would develop. And indeed, we saw as the challenge of uh, policy and public action as shaping those two things, democracy and the market economy, in a way that would produce a, a decent society. So that was the challenge. What did we expect from that? Well, I'm not sure what we expected. Some people thought that it was a kind of hole in one, that you just go immediately and rapidly to democracy and a well-functioning market economy. Well, anybody who thought that was dead wrong, uh, particularly in the former Soviet Union. Things went a bit better in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And there, I think, that was because they had been under the cosh of the totalitarian system for a much shorter uh, period of time. So expectations, it's hard to say what our expectations were, but those who thought you could do it all very quickly and you should do it all very quickly, um, I think in the end turned out to be wrong. I had the good fortune to be the second chief economist of the EBRD following on from John Fleming. I arrived when the EBRD was beginning a process of rebuilding. The first president, Jacques Attali, had left under a bit of a cloud, and the second president, uh, Jacques de la Rosière, 
uh, arrived at the same time as I arrived, or I should say I arrived at the same time as he arrived. So he was a president and I was the chief economist. The EBRD had begun lending uh, at that time, begun the financing of investments. And uh, I embarked on a, a reform, a study of the strategy for the EBRD based on uh, where it had got to, not very far, but based on where it had got to. And that strategy said, go further east, because it had begun by concentrating in uh, Central uh, Europe, go further east, take on, as it were, some of the more difficult challenges, uh, do more with the private sector, do uh, more with equity and do more with financial institutions. So that was a direction that we set. And I think that direction, that new strategy, which we put together right at the beginning of the time I was there, late 93, early 94, when we were starting, that strategy stood us in good stead. And it was founded, that strategy, on an understanding, I think, of what could drive the movement to a well-functioning market economy. And in those ideas, the, uh, the notion of well-functioning institution. W would the banks work well? Well, not if it was easy to, for the owners to uh, rip them apart from the inside. Would it make sense for outsiders to hold equity in a firm only if those firms were subject to the rule of law and so that the equity holders were um, protected? So those were examples of ways in which Gordon's central thoughts around the importance of the investment climate, the importance of uh, good institutions, they were embodied in the ideas that were around our strategy. And indeed, what we made central in the end to the work of the EBRD was building a strong investment climate, building a strong investment climate where people could anticipate the returns that they got from their investment. Not with certainty, because certainty is not on offer, but with reasonable confidence that they wouldn't be uh, taken apart or raided or skewed in some way that uh, was unfair or difficult for investors to manage. So really the institutional story got embodied very early on in the basic concepts, investment climate, and in the basic strategy of the EBRD. So I was fortunate when I arrived there at the end of 93 to have had, as it were, that period of a few years working with Gordon and the others in the Institute of Policy Reform, where I had a chance to clarify my own thoughts. But of course, as always, I learned enormously on the job. The difference between the time at the EBRD and the time at the World Bank um, was I think mostly in terms of the focus in the World Bank on fighting poverty. At the EBRD, the focus is on building new functioning market institutions in which people could invest, in which the economies could reconstruct and could grow. So that was the focus. It was more on processes, um, the ability to invest. Now that's not contradictory to the work of the World Bank, obviously not and the investment climate was very important in our understanding in both those institutions, the EBRD and the World Bank. But at the World Bank, there was a very strong focus on poverty. Uh, Jim Wolfenson was the president. He'd rightly uh, put poverty at uh, center stage in combating poverty. So if, in a sense, the World Bank was a bit more focused on the outcomes, whereas the EBRD was a bit more focused on the processes. And that was a function of the time at which the EBRD had been uh, created. So in the World Bank, for example, I worked a lot on Ethiopia, and uh, we worked very closely with Prime Minister Meles Zanawe, who had actually seen the point about building institutions, not trying to do everything at once, building an investment climate. And as a result, uh, Ethiopia was at the beginning of its change from what was seen as a, a basket case, perhaps in the 70s and the 80s, to now one of the more dynamic economies of Africa. Um, I went early on at my time at the World Bank to Brazil and Mexico. Um, middle income countries, but with a lot of very poor people within them. And uh, the view, I think, which Jim Wolfenson um, took forward, and I, we were absolutely with him on this, is that uh, uh, poverty anywhere 
is the uh, concern of us all. So because Mexico and Brazil were not as poor as India and um, Ethiopia, did not mean that you could ignore poverty in those countries, that we were obliged as a World Bank to be useful, to be helpful. And those were very interesting times. So uh, in Brazil, we worked with President Cardoso and then with President Lula. Um, in Mexico, it was mostly with uh, Vicente Fox, who had just taken over. But in both cases, there were very interesting examples um, of social security systems, which were starting to be linked to participation of kids in school, uh, participation in vaccination programs and so on. And that I think was a very interesting and innovative time. So those are examples from Ethiopia, examples from um, Brazil and Mexico of the kinds of things that uh, we did. And I, they were different from the EBRD, but they shared a common spirit, a common spirit in understanding the processes of development as being around two things the investment climate in which people make their investments, and investment in people themselves, in their education and their health, and their capacity to be involved and their ability to be involved. If we're to understand success and failure, we have to go back, as Gordon always took us, to the issues of um, governance, uh, institutions, and the investment climate. If people can uh, invest with some confidence not total, of course, but some confidence of the returns, they will take a longer term view. They will build things, whether it's an irrigation system for their small farm, whether it's um, a marble polisher so that they can go out and work in um, other people's houses who are investing in uh, their residences and building them up. If there's a good investment climate, um, people will invest. And that's true, of course, up to the very big uh, investments that people might make in infrastructure and factories and so on. So the investment climate is center stage, and that is essentially a function of how well institutions are working. Can people feel confident in the law to settle disputes? Can they feel confident in the local government to help them rather than to get in the way or indeed to act in a predatory way. Those are the kinds of things that influence the investment climate. They're closely related to how well the infrastructure functions. In a corrupt economy, someone has their uh, finger on the switch of your electric power and they're ready to turn it off unless you pay them. So that's an example of institutions that don't function well that clearly get in the way of investment and growth. So I think that's where you have to look. And from a very difficult beginnings in Ethiopia, those were built over time in a, in, a, in a gradual way, small moves as it were from the system, but they were moves which over time were many and built up into uh, something, something strong. I think you can see the economies of Central Europe, the Polish economy, for example, that was a success story. Poland, uh, of course, things haven't been always easy all of the time, but Poland has built itself back from the traumas of the and difficulties of the regime before the end of the 1980s. And so you've got Ethiopia and you've got Poland, two very different places, but they've been success stories because they uh, took time to invest and build institutional structures which gave people some confidence in their investment. And of course, things have gone badly, are things where institutions have disintegrated and civil war is clearly an example of uh, the collapse of institutions in a spectacular way. And that is always very bad for development. And of course, examples of um, civil war destroying economies are uh, still with us all too sadly. First, you have to begin with an understanding of the urgency and scale. So we have to understand the urgency and scale. We have to understand the uh, kinds of investments and innovations that are necessary. And we have to understand the policies that can bring it about and the institutions that can deliver. This is the kind of logic that uh, Gordon has led on uh, all his life. It's a pleasure to work with Gordon because 
Gordon sees the big issues. He wants to go after the big issues. Uh, the transformation of the economies of uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union was a huge issue. And of course it stays with us, but it was a critical issue around 1990. Gordon went straight for that. And he not only saw the big issues, he saw what was involved in the big issues, and there his emphasis on institutions was fundamental. And thirdly, he brought interesting people along with him. So um, a lot of people, you know, like Joe Stiglitz and George Akerlof, and you know, great economists and very nice people, wanted to work with Gordon, and I wanted to work with Gordon too. Clarity, determination, and decency. And if you put those three together, you get a leader, somebody who can not only understand institutions, but build institutions, and that's exactly what Gordon did. I'm talking into camera now. I wish I was talking directly to you, Gordon, and with the fellows there celebrating your wonderful contributions and career. Um, I do hope that uh, this is a modest contribution to your proceedings. I'm sure it will be a wonderful occasion. I just wish I could be with you. Okay, so to my left here uh, is uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama, who's the Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spoli Institute for International Study, a uh, uh, research affiliate at the European Center in uh, Stanford University. Uh, Francis Fukuyama is a very, very well-known uh, scholar. Uh, was written, you know, many books and articles. Was uh, extremely uh, influential. Let me just mention, uh, uh, from my point of view, and also many students of mine, we have read together uh, the origins of political order, or the political order and political decay, uh, which I think are absolutely uh, remarkable books. So, so uh, uh, very often, uh, economic history or political history is very Western-centric. Uh, uh, the work by uh, Francis Fukuyama certainly uh, does not uh, have that problem. And so, so in my opinion, these are uh, books that are absolutely amazing in terms of comparative analysis and that uh, uh, you know, are uh, certainly at least as interesting as the monumental work by Samuel Feiner on the history of government. So uh, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, it's a great honor. I'm not a long time uh, colleague uh, of Gordon Rouser, but I'm really uh, very honored to be included in this, uh, in this session. Uh, I have to tell you, I had to sneak out of Palo Alto this morning. Today is Stanford's homecoming day, and here I am at Berkeley uh, on the Stanford homecoming, so don't tell anybody that I'm here. Um, so I thought uh, I'm a political scientist uh, on a panel of economists, and I actually think that if you look at the question of what went wrong, uh, a lot of it is political, and so I'm going to address uh, some of those problems. So I, I don't think we need to review the disappointment that a lot of us have felt uh, in the way that the former communist world has developed since 1989. Uh, you have the rise of these populist governments, uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party in, in Hungary, the peace, the law and justice party in Poland. Uh, other populists in other Central European countries, you have uh, really persistent corruption in Bulgaria, Romania, uh, other parts of Eastern Europe. And then you have the emergence, of course, uh, of Russia as a consolidated uh, authoritarian state that is now projecting its influence very successfully uh, outside of its own uh, boundaries. And essentially, I think, a broad failure of liberal values to take hold in that part of the world. So I want to give an account of why I think um, we've been disappointed in, in these expectations. Uh, so the first thing to say is that I think the, the purely economic uh, explanations are probably not sufficient. Uh, I'll just give you the example of Poland. Poland was the most successful uh, member of the European Union in the decade preceding the rise of this populist law and justice party. It had the highest growth rate. And yet, you see uh, populism there as in, uh, uh, as in other uh, places. And the reason I think uh, this has happened is that the fundamental driver of a lot of the new populism is not uh, economic deprivation. That's the conventional wisdom that globalization has undermined working class jobs and led to you know, a lack of opportunities for less educated workers. That's, uh, that's true enough, but I think that it underestimates the degree to which 
the perceived threat is really seen as cultural rather than economic, or that the job loss is a, is a, is a loss of status that threatens people's sense of national identity, uh, but it's interpreted in this uh, cultural fashion. The trigger for the rise of these populist groups was the 2015 Syrian refugee crisis, when a million uh, Middle Easterners showed up in, in Central Europe uh, unannounced, and uh, it looked like governments were losing control of their borders. Uh, and that was really the trigger for, for these populists uh, to take over. A lot of ethnic minorities, uh, or majority, former ethnic majorities, uh, feel very much uh, under threat because of large-scale uh, immigration. Now, I'm no fan of Viktor Orban, <laughs> but I, you know, I think it's important to see things from his point of view. There are not a whole lot of ethnic Hungarians uh, left in the world, and a lot of them have moved, so about 20% of the population has left Hungary and moved to other richer parts of the uh, European Union uh, as a result of joining the, uh, the EU. And although there are very few refugees there or in Poland or in other parts of Eastern Europe, uh, I think you know, they have this very acute sense that uh, they're hanging on you know, by a thread to their national identity. And if it's diluted by large scale immigration of the sort that's happened in the Netherlands or uh, France, that their societies, as they understood it, are going to die. All right, another reason. The sociology of the region has, has shifted uh, enormously. Uh, it's no longer a class-based uh, division, but it's really an urban-rural division uh, that explains who votes for a populist party. And by the way, this is true in the United States, in Britain, in other uh, Western European countries as well. But by and large, there is a strong correlation across the world uh, between uh, well-educated, cosmopolitan people living in big urban agglomerations who tend to vote for liberal parties uh, and people that live in second and third tier cities, live in the countryside that tend to vote uh, for populists. Uh, it corresponds to a, you know, a, a cultural divide that's emerged, the social values of the people that live in uh, less densely populated uh, parts of the world tend to be much more conservative, traditional religion uh, is much more important to them. I think we underestimate, for example, you know, gay marriage spread like wildfire throughout the Western world over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, but it actually produced a huge backlash, and that's actually what con connects a lot of conservative evangelical Christian groups in the United States uh, all voting Republican to Russia. Uh, many Republicans see Russia as an ally in this cultural struggle against these sorts of liberal uh, values. Um, next factor really has to do with these demographic changes writ large. Uh, so the Schengen system of free labor mobility was invented by economists to maximize aggregate output, and it does that. It, it, it allows labor to flow to where it's most uh, efficiently used, and it maximizes individual uh, output. But unfortunately, societies are organized into these things called nations. And at a social level, I think Schengen has actually had pretty negative effects in both the receiving and the sending countries. In the receiving countries, it set off you know, this huge um, uh, anti-immigration backlash. So, it's also misunderstood that the, the Leave vote in Britain was driven as much by Poles as by you know, Jamaicans or, or, or non-white immigrants. 800,000 Poles moved from Poland to Britain in an 18-month period in the last few years. That's a lot of people for a country of about 60 million uh, people altogether. And that kind of rapid social change, I think, uh, you know, was simply very disorienting to people. But I think the worst effect is actually in the sending countries where, you know, the Baltic states, Hungary, Poland, uh, Ukraine have lost, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent of their population uh, over the last generation. They tend to be young, better educated people. And if you use Hirschman's, you know, uh, exit versus voice dichotomy. Basically, the people that should be exercising voice against authoritarian government are out now working in Germany or Britain or uh, some other Western European uh, country. Uh, I think that another factor is really the failure uh, of many former communist countries to actually inculcate liberal values in their citizens. The Germans spent a lot of time and effort using their education system after 1945 to 
teach their children about the Holocaust, about Germany's guilt in World War II. Uh, I think that the communists, by contrast, pretended that they'd solved these uh, historical issues. It was simply suppressed, and there was never any effort, effort on a social level uh, to make people accept you know, things like racial uh, diversity. And as a result, uh, once they joined the EU, they realized that they didn't share those, those, kinds, of, um, uh, those kinds of values. Ivan Krashtev and Stephen Holmes have written, I think, very perceptively about the way that I think we in the West kind of deceived ourselves that they actually, coming out of communism, shared the same kind of liberal values that people in Western Europe and North America uh, held. And it turned out that that was true for the generation uh, of activists that led the revolutions of 1989. But as you get further away from that transition point, uh, you're getting younger people that grew up under a very different uh, social and educational system, and they really didn't um, absorb those kinds of, uh, of values. Uh, another factor, free market economics in that region actually never struck very deep roots. Uh, I think that um, you can see this in the career of someone like Václav Klaus, you know, the former Czech uh, Republic finance minister who in the early days, in the uh, early 1990s, was a Thatcherite libertarian, uh, really hated the state and wanted to deconstruct as much of it as possible. He's turned into a nationalist uh, since then um, because actually the commitment to those liberal economic values was not uh, all that deep. And I'm afraid that that's true for an entire generation of, of activists that came uh, after that. Uh, there's finally some longer term cultural factors. Um, uh, you know, the closer you get to the Byzantine Empire, the less liberal people become. And it really has to do with the role of the Orthodox Church and the fact that in the West, you know, civil society and kind of independent centers of power outside of the state were fostered by a long history of, uh, you know, religious and other kinds of opposition. Uh, and that's simply not part of the, you know, the, the historical heritage uh, of that part of the world. Uh, I think that there were failures in the actual, so this gets more into the policy issues, failures in the actual transition process. I think other panelists will speak about this at greater length, but I would just point to one which is really the design of the European Union. I think actually the EU accession process was quite successful, probably the most powerful external driver of political reform to modernize the political uh, and policy systems of countries that wanted to get into the EU. It, it provided a huge incentive uh, at the end uh, uh, for a reforming country. The problem is that it has no mechanism for kicking countries out again if they start backsliding. And many of the countries in the Balkans have really done that in the last uh, few years. Romania, uh, you know, Hungary, uh, uh, so forth. Uh, it's particularly annoying in Hungary's case because 5% of their GDP comes as a, a subsidy from the EU, even as they you know, denounce the EU and, and blame it uh, for all of their, uh, uh, all of their uh, problems. Uh, and so therefore, there's really you know, a kind of failure in the, in the incentive mechanism that did help at one point, but I think um, is not helping now. Just a final little point having to do with media markets and the rise of social media. One of the things that that had, uh, one of the effects of that is that legacy media, TV and newspapers became less and less interesting to foreign investors. In the 1990s, there were German companies, uh, you know, Axel Springer all over that, that region, and they supported a very vibrant free press. But as those properties became less and less remunerative, uh, they were sold. And who do they sell them to? They sell them to Eastern European versions of Silvio Berlusconi, basically, to oligarchs who could use those media properties to bolster their political careers, and then once in power, uh, use their political power to protect their business interests. And that's a pattern, I think, that we see in Russia, we see it in Ukraine, we see it in the Czech Republic, uh, in many other parts of that uh, world. So those are some... Those are some suggestions for why we've been disappointed. Uh, I think there's some implications for policies that might have been done differently in the past and some for the future. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Goran Budioski, who is director of the Berlin office and co-director of the Open Society Initiative for Europe at the Open Society Foundations. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and it's an it's an honor. I had the pleasure to read, never never to meet in in, in person. Uh, and I like to introduce myself as a subject and object of that transition uh, myself. Uh, I come from uh, what is now known as North Macedonia, and uh, I spent also a lot of my career until last year actually uh, living in Hungary, and today I live in, I live in Berlin. And the reason I'm not mentioning so much about, about me, uh, uh, but it's also it's an interesting reflection of what has happened with the philanthropic activity of George Soros uh, uh, and how that, that reflects. Uh, last year, together with 174 colleagues, we had to close our uh, biggest hub office in, in Budapest, in Hungary, and, and, and make a transition. Basically, we moved to Berlin because we felt that uh, uh, we cannot do our work in Hungary with uh, uh, basically safety for our staff uh, and uh, integrity of, uh, of our data amidst a lot of anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and a direct smear campaign against our founder and, and against our, our, ourselves. Uh, in so many ways, I still witness, we continue working in Hungary. We, we actually, we, we increase our investments in Hungary. We even speaking a bit more about return uh, to Eastern Europe, which is we consider as our home turf for the foundation. Um, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, similar to, to Professor Fukuyama, we're also reflecting like what went wrong uh, in this transition and with this uh, poster chest. Now, with all what I just said to you, I'm actually very optimistic uh, about the last 30 years. And I'm very optimistic because uh, uh, we rather focus on the, on the gloom, sometimes on the doom, and we fail to see actually how much that uh, region advanced. And first of all, not only people like me, but the, uh, 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 millions of people who are plugged in into, uh, into globalization circuits. They're plugged in into much bigger markets. They're plugged in into much bigger academic and other spheres of life that would have not been possible be before, uh, before 89. I also believe I come um, uh, from political science, and you know, we, we always look at the economy uh, we, we, with a bit of a with a bit of a jealousy of determination, or determination, and overly sometimes. Uh, uh, um, and I found the question like, oh my goodness, wh why would you beat yourself so much about not being able to predict uh, the future and how the reforms went? Uh, uh, I don't think it's fair on any uh, uh, profession, including, including yours, the, the economy. Now, there are two snippets that I want to uh, that I want to reflect. Um, uh, uh, we have a good, good overlay. Uh, good overview by, by, by Professor Fukuyama. One snippet is that one thing that I, I don't think that in Central and Eastern Europe uh, we saw clearly coming, and that was the effect of globalization. And that was the effect of globalization uh, and, and the way how actually predominantly Western business was operate under the patronage of European Union. And let me just throw in some numbers to give you a sense. Um, Corporate profit tax paid in Hungary by Mercedes, 1.63%. GE, 0.0024% um, of corporate tax paid. Um, if that was bad enough, Audi is the champion at virtually 0%. I can go on. I can give you a list of, of, of other companies and other countries. Mind you, amidst those, actually, the Chinese and Korean companies seem like uh, champions of tax paying because they pay 8%, 9%, to the point even 16%. Now, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because um, capital did very, very well in Eastern Europe, and it's still doing very well. So when I reflect on Poland, when we look at the uh, sort of the, the, big the big institutions when it comes to capital, they worked really well. Now the question was, did they work well for the small people? And I think this was the whole thing where the radical right, and to some extent, with all their false promises, and uh, I think peace is a very interesting example of combining the social policy towards the small uh, 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 people, and the nationalism as a great sketch, 
they actually took some of those money and started distributing them uh, in an old-fashioned patronage system. And I think this is one thing that we forgot. Uh, and I, I particularly, if, if, I, if we think of, of bashing about the economic professions and political scientists like myself, I think we forgot to see where the spoils go. Because we were very happy, especially in Europe, oh, we see the Gini coefficients. Oh my goodness, we're so great. We're doing so great. Uh, look at the United States. Look at other places. We're good. But we forgot the small places, and we forgot how actually with the advance of, of, of globalization, with the advance of new technologies, people can see that. The second point, which I believe that was another myth, which we all really bought wholesale, was the, the convergence. The convergence that East and West will sort of come together, and you guys in Poland, you will be the new Germans, you Hungarians will be the new Austrians, and all this. And the 2009 crisis put an abrupt stop to it. Uh, if you look at the numbers, from 13% to 30% of the, basically the gross salary um, in Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, and then 2009 that stops and goes back until 2017. It, it literally towards German salaries, which were actually stagnating at the same point. And I think that's important to see, because then people see it real power, in, in, in real domain, and to some extent, that was parallel with a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, 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 what uh, Professor Fukuyama eloquently explained, a, a, a lot of uh, 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 strain on the political system as well. Let's not forget, at that point, we stopped being East and West, and East and West do not, does not explain. Because you look at Le Pen in France, uh, uh, what it did. You look at UKIP, what, I mean, we're witnessing the Brexit. You look even in Germany, which is a poster child. I mean, I can tell you that 57% of East Germans at this moment feel as a second class citizens. And still Germany, 30 years later, East Germany earns on average 70% less than West Germans for the same work done at all purchase parity. So it's a lot that has not been seen in the West Europe. And I think that that's really important to look at that. Greatest example of that is the internal migration. In my opinion, all the Syrians, all the refugee crisis of 2015 was just a veneer uh, at which actually a lot of internal uh, leaders, uh, leaders realize how much they're losing. One Italian economist put the price tag at 100 billion uh, euros that Germany has profited in, in getting people and the price of education and know-how that these people brought with them. Now, forget if that transfer was taxed in one way or the other. And let's not forget, in Europe, most of these people were trained on, uh, uh, actually, state budget and taxpayers' money in the poor countries. So there's a lot that we actually failed to see, and that's part of the, I, I, I avoid to mention on purpose the sort of the neoliberal paradigm, but it is important. And unfortunately, Orbans and Kaczynskis of that region, and Le Pen's, and Yuki uh, uh, leaders, they saw it first and they started capitalizing. Now, luckily for us, and this is my last, my last point, why I'm so optimistic, luckily for us, uh, something that uh, Professor Rouser and many other people pointed out, some of these institutions are actually present. People believe in the ballot box. In Hungary, two weeks ago, irrespectively of how everything was skewed, how the media is bought by cronies, sold by German business before, let's, let's make it sure, we had a handsome profit, nothing bad with the profit, uh, uh, but you know, they should not portray themselves as democracy promoters. Still there, at local level, on the municipal elections, people voted very much against uh, the, the ruling party. So the picture is not only mixed, but actually some of these institutions are there. And they have taken root. Not everybody is citizens. People in the cities are much more citizens than people in the rural areas. And I feel that foundations like ours, along other players, actually have a profound role now to go beyond the capitals. And we, we should actually, one of the things is we should stop believing in trickle down. I mean, all these theories that we know they are defunct, but we have to start implementing on the, uh, on the, uh, um, uh, in real life. Now, and to conclude, I personally am not a big fan of donuts. Uh, and I refer here to the Donut Economics, a popular book that makes the circuits uh, among non-economists. Uh, 
But one thing about that donuts that makes us think is actually to look at the broader, the broader uh, concept, to look at the climate and to look at the distribution of wealth. And I think these are the some institutions that in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe, we really have to sort out the sooner the better. Otherwise, I'm afraid uh, uh, even th those institutions that have taken ground, and I think in these 30 years we have to be proud, will fall to this uh, soft authoritarians like Orbán's and, 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 and Kaczynski's, supported predominantly by, by foreign business. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, next speaker okay. is uh, Stan Johnson, uh, who is the former director of the Center for Agricultural and Rural Development and who is the chairman of the board of the Institute for Policy Reform and a longtime colleague uh, and collaborator of Gordon Rouser. Yeah. So thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here and, and uh, be a participant in uh, a ceremony that really uh, commemorates and makes us understand the contributions that Gordon has made. Um, I want to start a little bit, be a little bit old. Uh, in 1969. Gordon and I were at the University of California at Davis. And that's when we're, our relationship started. And as I think about our time at the University of California at Davis, one thing stuck in my mind. He had three volumes of his PhD thesis. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that ever read <laughs> all those volumes. <laughs> and then uh, later on, after we were collaborating, I came to the University of California at Berkeley and worked with Gordon. And uh, we, uh, in the interim, this is between 19, middle 1980s and when we were in, in, at uh, Davis, we both uh, started and succeeded in building econometric models of the United States agricultural sector. And one of the things that made a, a big influence on us is that we discovered at that time that institutions were a lot more important than the market forces we were trying to model. And so there was every four or five years, there'd be a change in agricultural policy, pick and roll, uh, all these other things that came really caused us to rethink how we were going to do our models. And slowly, as we uh, started to learn more about it, we understood that the institutions were actually much more important than the market forces. And we started to work on those institutions. And that uh, materialized in our founding of the Institute for Policy Reform. And you can see behind me the uh, very uh, distinguished uh, professors that were involved or economists that were involved, and others that were involved in this. And I'm still thinking of old things. And I remember one of our colleagues was Al Harberger. And he used to get up and give a speech. It was almost the same one each time. <laughs> yeah, and he would say, uh, we don't, we, getting the prices right is not important. The real importance, and he would launch into institutional uh, things. And it was a very uh, enriching speech, but uh, not too many times over. <laughs> but it was great. So we founded the Institute for Policy Reform. Gordon actually did it, and I came along. And Al Harberger was involved. And we selected these economists that were behind us and other people who were, at that time, we thought, at the pinnacle of their professional ability, and also that were thinking about institutions in ways that we weren't thinking about it, and in ways that we were thinking about it. And they were uh, a great group of people. And it's very interesting. We paid them almost nothing, but they had great competition with each other. So they wanted to write very good papers because they would, we'd have presentations and they would come and they would see 
other people writing good papers, and they, it was a very interesting competitive uh, situation that we, that we thought about. And one of the things I remember uh, vividly, which some of the people have talked about before, was we had a big uh, conference in Prague. And it was these people doing their, uh, uh, talking about their institutional uh, things. And that was both the good news and the bad news. We came, we did it, and we went away. The bad thing is there wasn't anybody there to pick up what we were doing. So we came and made very nice discussions of institutions and uh, forward-looking things. And then we went away, and it was a seminar. It wasn't a, a transition or some uh, way that we could make a transition. And it's interesting to think that the organizations that were involved in supporting these economies, the USAID, the World Bank, and other people, had very short-term views about what they could do. And my feeling uh, from reading uh, our professor's book over here is that it's a long-term thing. And you have to have an ability to understand what the institutions are, and you also have to have some leadership. You can't do it in a vacuum without leadership. So uh, we had a great uh, conference in Prague. It was a great uh, learning experience, but we didn't leave behind uh, an, uh, a path to the future for these countries. Um, decades after, um, I tried several, I was in several countries, as Nick Stern was saying, and one of the countries was in Egypt. And an interesting pos pro problem was that they, there were traditional crops and uh, fruits and vegetables. The fruits and vegetables traded international market prices. The staple crops were controlled by people who uh, held prices low and uh, made money in the institutions. And, and agriculture was supposed to be the lead sector, but it didn't deal with what was looking at it as the biggest problem that they needed to think of. Um, uh, Gordon and I uh, have tried to practice what we preach Gordon became a dean, and he did a lot of institutional things at the University of California. I became a vice provost for extension and did some things that are revolutionary for Iowa. It turns out that many of the things I did were a step into the political, political economy, not just economics. And most of the people who run extension in this country are afraid to do that. So. Uh, we organized outside groups that were uh, interested in working with us to increase extension, and we doubled the extension budget in about five years. Other people have uh, uh, are just too cautious about uh, thinking about big things. So um, we both practiced what we preach. We both did things that were interesting and novel. And certainly Gordon has gone on, he's a little younger than I am, has gone on longer, has gone on. But the uh, thing is, uh, we'll leave it to future generations to carry on beyond us. And what I was gonna say at the end is that we grew old and matured together. But I thought about that and I thought, I don't think we matured together. <laughs> I think we just got old. <laughs> And, and uh, we, uh, we uh, leave it to other economists and other political scientists, but we've had an interesting road and we've done things in the institutional thing, in the Poli Poli Institute for Policy Room Forum that were more theoretical and more, and then we launched into taking positions that were where we thought we could do something for the university.
and Gordon certainly did a very, very good thing for Berkeley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the next speaker uh, is actually also via a video. It's uh, Joe Stiglitz. Uh, Joe Stiglitz does not need to be uh, uh, presented. Uh, uh, he uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics in 2001. He has done many, many things. Uh, let me just mention that he was uh, chief economist at the World Bank uh, during the uh, Clinton administration uh, uh, and also uh, chair of the Council of uh, Economic Advisors, so among others. Uh, can we show the video with Joe Stiglitz? My engagement uh, with uh, Gordon uh, in uh, the transition economies was uh, one of the most exciting uh, that I've been engaged in. Uh, it was uh, um, the, the end of communism and the transition of the communist countries to a market economies was really uh, one of the most, uh, one of the greatest challenges uh, facing economics maybe ever. Uh, we didn't have uh, a very good theory and very little empirical uh, basis for making uh, judgments about what ought to be done. Uh, after all, there had been nothing quite like it before. Uh, and in general, economic transformations, transitions, don't, are not easy. Um, and uh, uh, I was uh, particularly concerned uh, that while standard economics focuses on equilibrium, this was a question of dynamics and dynamics, you might say, out of equilibrium. Uh, it, 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 nobody had a basis of rational expectations of where this was going to go. Um, and I was very concerned that uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you might call, simplistic economics uh, based on uh, using overly simplified models of competitive markets, demand and supply, um, where there were well-defined rules would not apply to a situation where there were not well-defined rules and uh, where uh, the scope for exploitation, for bad behavior would be enormous. Uh, unfortunately, my worries turned out to, to be uh, correct and uh, the transition went very badly. Um, you know, everybody had said uh, Communism was an inefficient system. Central planning couldn't work. There were no incentives. Um, and the presumption of that failure of communists was that when you move towards a market economy, even if you didn't do it perfectly, GDP should soar. What happened in the case of Russia and many of the other Eastern European countries? GDP fell by a third. And... Uh, I have to say, I think a lot of it was a result of misguided advice from Westerners who didn't really fully understand how that transition uh, should go about. Um, and the work uh, of Gordon and the group that he put together um, uh, was really an attempt to counter that simplistic approach. Uh, in the end, uh, I'm afraid our influence was not as great as the influence of some others who may have had some uh, uh, special interest or some other concerns that were driving them, uh, or some ideological uh, misperceptions. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, my chapter uh, in that particular venture uh, was really concerned about the you might call it the institutional infrastructure associated with the financial system. Um, that making a, a good financial system work was absolutely essential, but extraordinarily difficult. Um, that you could not manage the process of privatization that was essential without a financial system, but uh, with uh, uh, 
a malfunctioning financial system, it would not necessarily serve society. And so what you have, what happened in Russia, for instance, you had uh, the uh, share, uh, the loans for shares deal that led to the oligarchs. Um, that oligarchy has led to Putin and the undermining of the democratic transition. I think the economists have to recognize that they bear a lot of the blame for that failure. It would have been difficult, and I can't say it could have been done well, but it couldn't. what the economists did, the shock therapy, the misguided privatizations, clearly set the stage for the problems that uh, uh, Russia is facing today. Um, there are, I think, a lot of lessons to be learned from that episode. Um, right now, uh, the world for the last uh, 20 years has been going through uh, another kind of economic transformation from a manufacturing economy to a service sector economy and an economy associated with climate change, urbanization, uh, movement to a service sector, to, you know, uh, uh, many, many other changes going on. And uh, we haven't paid adequate attention to the uh, social disruption that has been associated with that transformation, just like happened in uh, the transition from communism to a market economy. In fact, there's some analogies that have struck a, a number of people. Um, one of the things when I was chief economist of the World Bank that I found so disturbing was that as data was coming in about GDP going down by a third, uh, many people were incredulous. They said, data must be wrong. But then we started getting data saying that life expectancy was going down when in the rest of the world it was going up. Clearly symptomatic that things were not going well. Well, look at the United States. What's been happening in the United States for the last several years, every year, life expectancy has been going down. And as Ann Case and Angus Deaton have pointed out, a large part of that decrease is deaths of despair, suicide, drug overdose, alcoholism, the kinds of things that we saw in Russia when we didn't manage that transition very well, uh, evidence of social disorganization, you might say, um, and here we are in America facing some of those same difficulties in our transition. Those arguing for shock therapy thought there were somehow intrinsic economic laws that just uh, worked. You didn't, the underlying institutional infrastructure, the legal framework wasn't much uh, importance. It was underlying economic forces that drove everything. Well, now we realize that markets don't exist in a vacuum. They are structured by our laws, corporate uh, governance laws, bankruptcy laws, um, monopoly laws, labor laws, and so forth. And that uh, how you structure them has a very big uh, consequence for the overall performance of the economy and, in particular, who are the winners and who are the losers. And so one of the uh, important items in the agenda is, can we find a set of rules, make sure that we have, might be called economic justice, uh, rules that in which most citizens uh, benefit. Part of that new view is a, a better understanding of the appropriate balance between the market and the state and civil society um, which uh, got lost in uh, some of the ideological discussions of 40 years ago. The United States did, uh, played a, a critical role in creating the, we sometimes call it the rules-based system of globalization. Um, 
when I say rules-based, it's also norms-based. There were norms of good behavior. Not everything can be embedded in a, in a, in a law. And the United States played uh, an important role in setting both the laws and the norms uh, of good behavior. Now, we should be clear, I, I was very critical of some of the details of those rules. I thought they were written disproportionately by corporate interests in the United States to advantage those interests at the expense of developing countries, emerging markets, workers globally. And so there was much to criticize. But as Trump uh, has entered the scene, uh, we've come to appreciate that even second best rules are better than no rules. The law of the jungle uh, just doesn't work. It was necessary for all the major powers, and particularly for the United States, to uh, enforce that global consensus. We didn't want to have another World War I or World War II. Um, it wasn't a perfect system, but it maintained global peace, relative global peace, in the decades after World War II. Well, with uh, the U.S. unilaterally abrogating the uh, Iran agreement, um, with uh, the U.S. Uh, president praising dictators around the world, uh, we're in a new world. And that has provided license for uh, a new class of abusive practices like uh, what is happening in Kashmir uh, by India, uh, the list of countries where uh, authoritarian figures have suppressed basic human rights uh, is just phenomenal and uh, can't help, one can't help but think of back into the era of fascism that we had um, before World War II and the dangers that that might bring about. And just like, you know, internally uh, within our country, uh, we say what makes, what are the reason, one of the reasons the United States or Western Europe are successful is there's a rule of law. And the same thing is true for the global economy. You cannot have a well-functioning economy without a rule of law. There's, there, there's no simple uh, way of saying what is going to be good policy advice versus bad policy advice. Um, uh, you, I might, you might say almost simplistically, almost always advice based on ideology, overly simple models is going to fail. The world is too complex to be put into simple models. So you can't ignore the lessons of economics, but what we teach in Ec 101 is a long way from what we need to use when we come to a complex situation like the transition from communism to a market economy. Uh, and uh, um, there were, uh, let me give an example of an interesting uh, contrast. Um, I was uh, also brought in into the discussions at the very beginning of China's transition from communism to not a market economy, but what you call uh, a social market economy with Chinese characteristic, a, a distinctive uh, a, a aspect. One of the things that emphasized a lot in our work is, is a, you might call it the soft infrastructure. Yeah. We talk about the hard infrastructure and you need roads, but the soft infrastructure of the institutions uh, are critical. And that was one of the things that uh, Gordon emphasized a lot. Um, an example of, of uh, the difference in mindset, uh, many of the people advocating uh, shock therapy uh, said, privatize first, 
And then the institutions that will make the economy will evolve. Uh, and my response to that is, if you privatize and you create uh, oligarchies, pol uh, plutocracies, um, you're not going to get the right institutional infrastructure. So our last speaker is uh, Yang Xie, who is uh, assistant professor at the Department of Economics of UC Riverside, uh, but who actually did his PhD here. Uh, Yang, you have the floor. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Gerard, for the introduction. Uh, I mean, first, I, I would like to say thank you and congratulations to, to Gordon for this nice event and this uh, wonderful career. Uh, you know, Gordon uh, uh, so taught the first political economy course that I took uh, in Berkeley. It, it really confirmed my interest in political economy. And after that, Gordon uh, hosted my uh, oral exam and then served in my oral uh, uh, dissertation committee. And he has been extremely supportive and helpful and encouraging throughout the years, even though it's a very short career for me now. Uh, and it's needless to say that uh, I feel very honored to be included here uh, with my, uh, many of my own professors, you know, uh, on the stage lecture, out of the stage, uh, Brian, David, and many others. I'm merely a little kid from this department, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, and also with these uh, stellar scholars that I always uh, look up to. Uh, no, no, it's, uh, but still, this is, uh, uh, you know, thank you very much and congratulations to Gordon, you know. So, uh, second, I want to say a bit about uh, the transition in China following, actually, uh, Stiglitz's uh, comment. Uh, I, I did a bit research when I was writing my dissertation, and I'm from China. Uh, so my take about the transition experience in China is that it's uh, very political in at least two senses. Uh, in the first sense, uh, it's very political uh, that uh, there was not really a consensus to really do a market economy until very late. You know, that happened around 1995. Uh, but from the very beginning, from 1978, uh, the party leadership was very clear that uh, any initiative, any reform, no matter what's the content, approach, strategy, direction, it has to strengthen the power and control of the party in China. I think, I mean, uh, Gerard will hold very similar view. So the market economy uh, is picked, is adopted, uh, not only because it worked in the second best scenario, even in this Chinese context, but also because uh, the party has to rely on economic performance heavily for its own legitimacy uh, after the totally mass, uh, after the Cultural Revolution. Right? There's no other source of legitimacy available at that time, basically. Uh, so understanding this, I think, is easier for us to understand uh, why there is generally a lack of progress in the political side, as many of us or many people here have hoped. Uh, and many people have already seen this even earlier uh, for as early as, for example, in 1989, uh, George Soros retreated from the Open Society Foundation, retreated from mainland China because he figured out that it's basically there's no way to do that, right? So that's the first sense that why it's quite political, because it's the objective, the the ultimate objective is to hold the power of the party. Right? The second part that I think it's uh, uh, political is that how the transition has been pan out. Uh, really depends a lot on the politics within the party and generally the, I mean, in the country. Uh, one prominent example is actually about the adoption of the gradual and experimental approach that, uh, uh, for example, Stiglitz has just mentioned. So this distinguished uh, China from many Eastern European and former Soviet Union countries. Um, so in the late 70s and early 1980s, there were actually uh, two, at least two factions within the party uh, who, are, who were both politically very strong. Uh, but they have very different ideas about whether market economy will work and how we should do the reform. So uh, they eventually they agreed upon this uh, e uh, experimental or gradual approach. And one of the reason, I think, a primary reason is that they were very convinced about their own idea and they were hoping uh, 
that the result of those reform initiatives will prove their position actually correct. And this can be used not only to convince the other faction, but also uh, as a weapon to, again, uh, to gain within the uh, political fight within the party. So that's just uh, uh, one example about how this uh, transition has been pan out is, I mean, has been influenced a lot by politics in general. Uh, so that's about my take about the transition. Uh, of course, now we are in a critical time uh, in the world, uh, and also in China, uh, where China is now and uh, where China is going and what's the implications for the world. So looking back into the transition period would be Let's say, I mean, looking back into the transition where even the history before that would be helpful uh, for us uh, when we think about other things. Uh, so I'm looking at the time, you know, I, I, I know that we want to get more questions from the audience. I just want to mention one thing that I want to uh, say before, I mean, in case that nobody asked about this. So in the recent like four or five years, uh, there has been a general <laughs> negative sentiment uh, against China. I mean, not only Trump, you know, so not only from Trump, so this is, I, 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 I see that that's a general sentiment in the intellectual world, in the Western world. So many people were thinking that maybe China is proposing an alternative approach to the ideal that uh, many of us cherished, uh, uh, or threatening this. Uh, uh, I would say just my own thoughts, 30 seconds about this. You know, if, to the ideal of individual freedom, uh, economic prosperity and social equality, China is not definitely uh, proposing an alternative viable approach. If you look at the economic prosperity, definitely China has been doing a great job in uh, relief uh, uh, people from poverty. But at the same time, there is clearly a lack of uh, individual freedom. At the same time, if you look at inequality by the recent research by like Piketty published in AER, we see that the inequality in China across all the measures are almost as bad as the United States. Uh, so, uh, so here, China is not providing an alternative approach. Right? So as long as the uh, intellectuals in the Western world can solve uh, the, uh, the problem in liberal democracy that, as uh, uh, Stiglitz has mentioned, you know, uh, rising inequality at the same time, this huge despair or loss of hope of many people in the community you know, the ideal to the three things, you know, individual freedom, economic prosperity, social equality will be fine. So China is not really the threat there, you know. So as long as uh, people here can do more, uh, these three ideals will be fine. So that's, that's my thought. Thank you very much. So we have uh, like uh, probably 10 minutes, and I see here for comments by former senior fellows at the Institute for Policy Reform. Since we don't have much time, maybe we'll take comments first and then uh, uh, ask the panel to react towards the end. So, Hi, Brandon. David, I have the uh, distinct honor of working for Gordon, which uh, was fun. I'll put it that way. Um, can you talk about Hong Kong a little bit, and especially as it relates to uh, the economy as a whole and Beijing's strategy for dealing with them. So that's, well, let's, take, let's take questions first, otherwise we'll not. Uh, so, next one. Assuming we survive the existential uh, uh, threat to the world from climate change, is it inevitable that China becomes the world power going forward? And if it is, what's the world going to look like? Um, a lot of depressing things have been said in this panel. And I particularly wanted to ask Professor Fukuyama, is anything good going to happen over the next 20 years? <laughs> Lots of deep questions. Uh, uh, so, any, any more, uh, any more comment? Um, okay. So, so uh, yeah. So, there, so three questions about you know, Hong Kong, uh, whether China will become a, a, a world power, and is anything good going to come out? So, so, so maybe Yang, you, you. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah. I. So these these questions are are very controversial, especially for a Chinese citizen. Uh, so 
So I will just, uh, you know, the second question, I think, um, I mean, actually, the two questions many of us can answer. Uh, I will just say one thing about the Hong Kong situation. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's not my job to really speculate what the paramount leader in our country will do. We, we uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I want to say, I, I want to provide a little bit background about what's going on. You know, this whole thing started with this uh, repatriation bill, and then there were protests uh, for, uh, in the name of, for example, uh, democracy, more freedom, and also uh, sometimes even independence. Some, sometimes the protest has been violent, and sometimes it's fine. You know, uh, we have been seeing a lot of reports from all the things. Uh, uh, one way that I look at this is something I didn't see many people mention this uh, in media. Uh, so that's from my own reading of history. So Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong has become a great city only after, only during the process, after the gold rush here. So 1840s, you know. So, so the Hong Kong become a great city uh, in the wave of gold rush and also the boom of trans-Pacific trade and migration. So then Hong Kong becomes a major hub for Chinese migrants, most of them Cantonese, right? Having a great hope about the life outside China, right? And so this is the place where people who have seen the outside world, seen the good and bad there, but meeting with their country fellows who still have the hope uh, to uh, strive for a better future. Right? And this is also where you have public good provision made by remittance uh, from the outside world back to China, and also luxury good, luxury good uh, traded from Canton, from other part of China to the outside world. Right? So what's Hong Kong? You know, I think the historical and cultural identity of Hong Kong is Hong Kong is a gatekeeper of the prosperous reality of the Western world between the Western world and China. It, it's also the gatekeeper of sometimes the rosy imagination of the Western world, right? So this is Hong Kong. So if we re uh, realize this, we can, in some sense, understand, especially those extreme part of these protest movement, that how could these people stand for being ruled by people, uh, some of them who think culturally inferior, right? So that's the cultural and historical background behind this movement. Uh, so I think it's more than political and other arrangement. So to really solve this problem, there will be, uh, there, I mean, that really need take time because we are playing against 200 years of history. Maybe one minute left for <laughs> the next 30 years. <laughs> so um, just on the question of is anything good going to happen, I think it's really important. I, I agree very much with Goran's uh, um, assertion that the world is not all terrible. Uh, there's actually a lot of uh, pushback against populists, against authoritarian government. Uh, in the past year, or let's say the past three or four years, you've had popular uprisings in Ukraine, in Algeria, in Sudan. Uh, Ethiopia has opened up big time, Armenia, Nicaragua. And so people don't like to live under authoritarian government. I think a lot of that spirit of, of um, 1989 is actually still, uh, still there. In this country, uh, we're in a you know, constitutional crisis right now, but I sometimes think that the long-term impact of Donald Trump will be to shift the entire country way to the left and make possible a lot of social uh, and economic policy reforms that simply were not possible under the previous uh, equilibrium. Because I do think that you know, our democratic systems have stronger checks and balances uh, today than they did in the 1930s. And so I think you know, and the, and the most powerful of those checks is, a, is an electoral one. So I do think there's hope. So I'd like to thank all the panelists and the audience for their participation.